21st century, we often feel more than ever the need to attempt to confront those surrealistic events that come down to us under the modern of the Holocaust. On what is perhaps the most profound level, that means surrounds our desire to comprehend how, in the modern age, humanity has not only been incapable of controlling its most barbaric impulses, but has, in fact, made of the very bulwarks of modernity, rationalism, racism, bureaucracy, technology, nationalism, a uh, matter to streamline and expedite prejudices and cruelty. <coughs> Our keynote speaker tonight, Professor Lawrence Langan, Langer, uh, Emeritus of Simmons College, is without question one of the preeminent literary and cultural critics of the subject of the Holocaust. Professor Langer has devoted his entire scholarly life by asking some of our generation's most trenchant questions about memory, event, and artistic representation of the catastrophe now subsumed under the awesome symbol, Auschwitz. Of his most recent publication, Preempting the Holocaust, uh, former director of the US Holocaust um, Museum, Michael Berenbaum, has stated, quote, Lawrence Langer has become a conscience demanding that we grapple with the implications of the Holocaust, the real implications, its evil, end quote. Not only has Professor Langer sustained his research and insight in books and articles for some 30 years, his earliest study of the Holo of Holocaust fiction and the parameters of oral representation in art, entitled The Holocaust and the Literary Imagination, <coughs> at Yale University Press, 1975, was one of the first projects of its kind, and indeed set a standard for how we come to study those events through their place in the, in the stories we tell, and the memories and documentation we choose to build our narrative from. At the outset of this decade, after much arduous work locating and reporting eyewitness accounts of a host of Holocaust survivors, Dr. Langer published Holocaust Testimonies, The Ruins of Memory, also Yale, 1991, which, based on its invaluable contribution to our generation's historical recognitions, won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Criticism, I was later listed by the editors of the New York Sunday Times Book Review as one of 13 books of particular permanent interest published during the previous 100 years. As well as being a renowned scholar, Dr. Langer is also a devoted teacher and recipient of many prestigious awards. He has taught at institutions ranging from Yale to the University of Connecticut to his present position as Emeritus Alumni Chair Professor at Simmons College. Professor Langer has been a Fulbright Scholar in Graz, Austria, has won NEH Fellowship for Independent Scholars, and in 1996 was awarded the Maurice C. Shapiro Senior Scholar in Residence position at the U.S. Holocaust Research Center in Washington, D.C. We are indeed privileged to host Dr. Langer tonight, actually for the second time. He joins us here uh, after coming to our program in 1993. Uh, please join me now in a warm welcome to Professor Langer in anticipation of the book's Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. At least you didn't do what the person who introduced me at my previous lecture at UCLA did. And after his generous introduction, compliments to yours, he folded up my lecture, put it under his arm. <laughs> <laughs> I stood there for a while, looked at him. I said, thank you for your generous introduction. Uh, I wish I could uh, reciprocate, but if you'll give me back my lecture, I think I embarrassed him. Uh, it was his fault, not mine. I'd like to talk for a while tonight, and after I finish, I'd like to speak to you for a while tonight, and after I finish, I'd like to speak with you for a while tonight. So please don't hesitate that time to raise any issues that are on your mind or has any questions that you may have. And if I can't answer them, I'll tell you. Um, I'd like to discuss five examples tonight of how the Holocaust has not only affected but afflicted the sensibilities of five different people who approach that event in five different ways. I'd like to cut through some of the rhetoric that's grown up around the Holocaust, expressions like death, <coughs> dignity, the will to resist, the triumph of the human spirit, the integrity of the self, and to allow a number of voices that experience the event convey their response to particular moments 
the conflicts that remain engraved are in memory, uh, not in terms of that rhetoric, but as you'll see, it's quite different and more painful terms. The common theme on music, for all these five examples, is family experience. The first one will be two uh, brief fragments from testimony of Holocaust survivors. The second will be a fragment from a memoir written by a man in the Lord ghetto who did not survive. After the war, uh, this bag was found, found on the floor in the room in the Lord ghetto. Third example will be a very brief short story, which I'll read to you, it's only two pages long. It will give us a fictional approach to the problem of the family experience. Fourth example will be an even briefer poem, I think it has six lines in it. Again, about, I like to see a different kind of family experience. And then I'm going to end with two paintings by a Holocaust painter and survivor of, of the building ghetto, the artist Samuel Bach, and uh, we'll then see five various approaches to a common dilemma. We like to believe that even under the harshest circumstances, at least whenever possible, families during the Holocaust were able to maintain their unity and offer them mutual support, because that's how we conceive of the family today. But if we confront examples of the way it was, and I will try to give you five examples of the way it was, we're forced to revise our supposition. This leaves us staring at a reality we're unfamiliar with, required to encounter a moral discontinuity that intrudes on our comfortable notion of how people relate to each other in the human community. The inhuman community of the Holocaust disrupts our limited. This is one of the problems we still have to confront today in facing the Holocaust. It disrupts so much, we prefer to see examples uh, from the Holocaust of resistance, of rebellion, <clears throat> of uh, rescue, and don't introduce, introduce us to a world of discontinuity. Those are exceptions, not the norm. What I'm going to talk about tonight uh, is, was the norm and abnormal norm during the Holocaust. I'm going to begin with two, as I said, brief examples. Holocaust testimony. The first is a couple, a married couple, husband and wife. In the beginning, I've, I've done about 60 or 70 interviews myself, and I've seen maybe 250 or 300 videotaped interviews from the Fortune Video Archive at Yale University. <coughs> These come. In the beginning, we did a couple of interviews with husband and wife, but we stopped doing that very quickly for a number of reasons. Um, they interfered with each other, they intruded on each other, and we decided that each deserved, deserved his or her own private space in telling his or her own separate story. If you watch the, watch the body language as the husband and wife sit next to each other on the couch, and one tries to enter into the story of the other and see what happens uh, as a result of an attempt to enter in. Now, this interview, from which this excerpt was taken, went on for nearly three hours. And I have to tell you in advance that this is a very happily married couple. One of the things that emerged from watching these testimonies, and I watched them for four or five years before I realized I had something to write about them, um, one of the most interesting ideas that emerged is that there's not one story in these testimonies, but two stories. There's a chronological story. I was born so and so. I grew up in this town, a village, or shtetl of city, and my parents did this, and then the Germans came, and we were put in the ghetto, we were deported, and some of us were killed, and some of us survived, and came to the ghetto. That's a chronological story. Move from the past to the present, into the future, to a present, into the future. And although you can't say it's a happy story, there is a sense of vindication to it because obviously the person telling the story survived that travail, survived the atrocity, lived to tell about it, and with very few exceptions, got on with his or her life, established a family, usually worked productively, had children, and grandchildren, and so forth. And at the end, they tell about their daughter and son, both of whom were married and had children, very happy family. But there's another kind of narrative in this testimony, it's not every single one, but in enough to make me, to have made me realize that there's something to analyze and interpret here. 
the, what I call not the chronological narrative, but uh, the durational narrative. That is the emphasis of particular moments in time, in the camp experience, and we'll get examples of them in a minute, uh, which do not re-enter the flow of time after the war and absorb into it, but stay fixed in memory as something that can't be reconciled, can't be transcended, remains as a kind of scar. And if you listen, it begin with the very end of the husband's story, just about half a minute, and then you get the wife's story. And you'll see that each one is in what I call his or her cocoon of remembering. And they're separate. Although, as I said, that they are a happily married couple, that's in their chronological life, which is in real life. But in the duration of moments, which is equally real and vivid, they can't interact with each other. They become very clear to listen because they're separate stories. They can find it. Part of the pain, even the anguish, listening to these testimony, to hear the voices of survivors talk about at the same time their relief of having come through and stayed alive and got on with their lives and their anguish at other people's deaths getting on with them, so to speak. And they have to establish some kind of balance or compromise, or as one of them says, compartmentalization as they uh, get on with their lives. So let me show you the first one, and I'll talk a little bit about it. No heavens, alone, cold and hungry. How my brother was always praying, so some friends of his needs became religious and started to pray. He prays that he shouldn't be killed for the world. So he became sick. And they took him to the hospital. They didn't give him any medication. And one night I came up there, and I myself was sick before, uh, typhus, and he had typhus fever. And I knew the feeling from experience. Um, and he was laying there in bed. He said, he gave me the jacket, the blue jacket. He said, yeah, I can do it. And they took him out. They cleaned out the hospital. And they took him out to Bert's uh, and Scottish school, the shuttle. I had that baby boy. And uh, I didn't have food for the baby. So I took out, I took milk from my bread and I showed to other mothers for a piece of soap, a potato. And I didn't have where to put the baby, so we had a chair, and we cut off one leg of the chair in order to wrap the baby. The chair should wrap, so we put the baby there on the chair. And um, while I was taking milk, I was uh, getting lumps in my breast. And I went to the doctor, and she said that, uh, I had pus in my breast because I didn't have the proper food and I started to have pain and she said we have to operate. So I had to go there for myself and I went and she operated with no injections. They took us to the buses, they brought us to a big airfield and nearby were our trains, the cattle trains. And um, as I look back, at, I think at the, for a while I was in a daze. I didn't know what was happening, actually. I saw the taking away the men separate, the children separate, and the women separate. So I had, had the baby, and I took the, the coats that I had, the, the bundle. <coughs> And I wrapped around the baby and I put it on, on my left side. 
because I thought the Germans were saying left or right. And I went through with the baby. But the baby was short of breath, started to choke, choke and it started to cry. So the German called me back. He says, what, what do you have there in German? Now, I didn't know what to do because everything was so fast and everything happened so suddenly. I wasn't prepared for it. To look back, the experience was, I think I was numb or something happened to me, I don't know. But it wasn't, I wasn't there. And, um, he stretched out his arms. I should hand him over the bundle. And I handed him over the bundle. And this was the last time I had the bundle. But as I look back, I don't think that I had anybody with me. I was alone within myself. And since that time, I think all my life I've been alone. Even when I met Jack, I didn't tell Jack my past. Jack just found out recently. I think to me I was dead. I died and I didn't want to hear nothing, I didn't want to know nothing, and I didn't want to talk about it, and I didn't want to admit to myself that this happened to me. <coughs> and still I found the doctor who operated on me in the ghetto, and they brought us in there. And when she saw me there, she was so happy to see me. And I always said, what is it? What have, where's the baby? What happened to the baby? And right there, I said, what baby? I said to the doctor, what baby? I didn't have a baby. I don't know of any baby. That's what it did to me. People to visit, and it uh, was very good for a while. And we bought a home. Now let me let me say a few words about that before we look at the next one. <coughs> You'll notice how she tries to enter into his narrative by handing him a picture. <clears throat> he takes it, puts it back, and he says, I don't need it. And at that very moment, he says, my brother took off his shirt, so it's here. He says, I don't need it. His brother gave him the shirt. There's no way in which she can enter into his, what I call his durational moment of remembering, not because she lacks sympathy, but because it belongs to him and not to her. It's not a shareable experience. Any more than he can enter into hers when the camera pans to his eyes, and she says, to look back on it, I was alone and within myself. And she says, I think that ever since that time, all my life I've been alone. And my husband is sitting next to her on the couch. Now, I think he understands what she's saying. Nevertheless, it's a very painful statement. In terms of her first husband who was killed, and the baby whom she's now calling a bundle, who was taken away and killed all her life, she has been alone. So that's the, those two dimensions, the, as I mentioned, the chronological and the durational narrative of their existence. But if you listen carefully to her words, you can learn an awful lot. She said, when the German soldier said to me, when you got there, give it to me. She says, no, I didn't know what to do. Everything happened so fast. It was so sudden, I wasn't prepared for it. And if you reflect for a moment, you ask yourself, how does a human being prepare for that moment in the future when a German soldier is going to say, give me your baby so that I can kill it? There's no way to prepare for that. Anyway, there's a way to prepare for that moment when you're asked to disrobe and go into a room for showers, which are really gas chambers, and you don't know what they are, and you haven't prepared for it, there's no way to prepare for it. She makes it very clear. She can't be blamed for handing over her baby. If she hadn't, she would have been shot, as well as uh, the baby. She also says, at that moment, I was dead. I died. I didn't want to know nothing. I didn't want to say nothing. I didn't want to talk about 
Now, of course, that's a contradiction. Since she's alive, she can't be dead. But one of the notions that emerges, from, and a very difficult notion of these testimonies, is what I call the death life, or the re-death of some of um, the survivors. She is experiencing not a rebirth of the self at that moment. She's experiencing a re-death of the self. And that doesn't mean anything in scientific terms. Not the thing is a re-death of the self. Once you die, you're dead. But in terms of this experience, we have to allow for the possibility that that's not just a dumb statement, but a very meaningful one. Part of herself has died at the moment when she gave up her baby for the bundle to death. And in the beginning, she suppressed it by saying, what baby? Never had any baby. I don't know what baby you're talking about. But she knows perfectly well what baby is being talked about. That's what I mean when I say that, although she is getting on with her life, death continues to pursue her through the memory which she narrates here. Now, I want to show you one more example of this uh, you know, testimony. A number of essays have been written about the special experience of women in the camps. I have had two good friends right now who are completing books on the experience of women in the camps. There's some controversy over whether the experience of women was essentially different from the experience of men. I spoke at a conference in Jerusalem a couple of years ago, and women in the Holocaust and other people in the room uh, was Israel Gutman, one of the deans of Israeli Holocaust historians, a survivor of Auschwitz himself and of the Warsaw Ghetto, and he kind of, uh, in a grumbling voice, says, the gas chamber didn't distinguish between men and women. When you suffocated, you didn't suffocate by gender. That's true enough. Nevertheless, uh, only women were pregnant in the camps, and only women uh, gave birth in the camps, and that's an example I want to show you. This doesn't mean that husbands wouldn't have suffered in their way as much as women wives did, uh, this wife did, but I, uh, to give you a sense of how the family experience was affected by the normal experience of pregnancy and childbirth in camps. I want to show you this example. You know, the most part of my being in concentration camp was nine months pregnancy. I was pregnant when I came to camp. In the beginning, I didn't know that I'm pregnant, nobody. Mm -hmm. But when I find out, that was, it's hard to, to understand what I went through. Especially the last days when the child was pushing to go out. And I have, I was afraid I'm going to make it. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, how we call the bed, you know, the bunk uh, bed. And they're gonna beat me up, and I was so afraid because I got 21 in my leg, and all the time my body was, you know, blue. The whole body was blue, and I was afraid of beating because I didn't want to be crippled. I said to myself, if something like that, they'll shoot me, you know, to finish my life, because it was very hard to live, very hard. Many times I was thinking to go on the wire who would touch it and, and just finish that. And in the back of my head was, who gonna tell the world what happened? Could always the same thing. And when I came back one time from the outside, I got terrible pains and we have a midwife in, in the box. And she hear um, the way, you know, and she said to me, come on on the oven, oven. You know, in the barrack was a brick oven, going through, come on the oven. I went at the oven and the baby was born. And she said, you have a boy. And she took away the boy, and till today, I don't know where is the boy. I beg her, I get crying, and I ask her to give me the baby. I'm very, I said, 
said, I don't want to live. I want to die with my baby. Give me my baby. I, I, don't, I don't have any, uh, you know, how you say it? I, I lost my, you know, strength and everything. I can't fight anymore. I want to die. And she looked at me and she sat down and she begged me to cry down. She said, you're so beautiful. You're going to find your husband. You're going to have children. Still children. I still have a divorce, but she told me. I said, I can't live anymore. I want to die. And until now, I don't know where it's my baby. I was lucky. I find my husband at the divorce. I didn't know for three months if he's alive, but I knew for I count on two people, my sister and my husband. And this alive, that's alive. I find my husband. And finally we make home in Marburg and in Germany. And I was afraid to have a child, he wants family. And I said, for what? Again gonna happen again, they're gonna kill our, our children. I was afraid of it. And I got my son. I was pregnant with second child. And I didn't want it. I was afraid again. And I said to my husband, I don't want to have a child anymore. I hate to be in Germany. I hate all the Germans. I can't stand this stones. It's covered with blood. Everything is in blood. And I was so, you know, if, if he was thinking to, to have a baby, I was angry at him. And I said, fine, I'm going to go and look how to get rid of it. I went, I got it. A number of essays have been written by people whom I think should have known better about the dignity of being a woman in the camps, arguing that whatever else they could take away from you, they could not take away the dignity of maternity and the dignity of giving birth. Uh, I don't understand how anyone can say something like that, given this kind of testimony. And this is not unaccept this is not exceptional testimony. This is, I won't say common, but this is not the only time this kind of thing happened. Um, there is a school of thought that the anguish of a mother in having to lose a baby is different from the anguish anyone else could possibly feel. Uh, on the basis of the evidence I found, I don't think that uh, that idea could be substantiated at all. I want to turn now to the experience of a father and a child. In the Lodge ghetto, in early September of 1942, in the Lodge ghetto, the Germans decided that there were too many people in the ghetto. They had to move some people out. Uh, they didn't have enough food for all of them. And so they said they would transfer the unproductive elements to a uh, less demanding camp in the east. Now, we know what they meant by that was the gas chains. They announced they wanted 10,000 Jews. And they asked the elder of the Jews of the large ghetto, whose name was Chaim Rampovsky, to ride them with the 10,000 Jews to be selected from the elderly, the ill, and all children under 10. And Rukowski, in a very famous speech called the Give Me Your Children speech, which was transcribed as he was giving it, so we have a record of it, he said to the Jewish population, the Lord together, give me your children. Uh, they cut off an arm so that we can save the body. His philosophy in the ghetto from the beginning was that in order to save as many as we can, we may have to give up some. But this sum turned out to be 10,000 people. And so parents, uh, ran all over the ghetto uh, in the next few days trying to change the birth certificates of their children, to hide their children, and passed it over. The review was called A Father's Lament. Uh, it's an anonymous remnant. We don't know who wrote it, as I said earlier. It's written in Yiddish on the back of 
uh, four pages of soup kitchen records from the left ghetto, as I said, was found uh, after the ghetto was liberated by Russian troops. And he writes on Wednesday, September 8, 1942, Yesterday, I lost Mucha, my sweet little daughter. I lost her through my own fault, cowardice, stupidity, and passivity. I gave her up defenseless, I deserted her. I left the five-year-old child, did not save her, and I could have done it so easily. I killed her myself because I didn't have the least bit of courage. I have blood on my hands, the guilt is mine because I did nothing to rescue her. Instead of hiding with her in the cellar or in the toilet, I put her in a clothes basket and she gave herself away with crying. Naked, barefoot, miserable, my dear child, it's me, your father, who betrayed you. It's me, driven by selfishness, who did nothing for your salvation. It's me who spilled your blood. What punishment awaits me for killing my own blood? There was no need to do anything heroic in order to save or protect her. On the contrary, I made this offering myself without being asked. I killed the child with my own hands. I am broken. I feel guilty. I am a murderer, and I must atone because I won't find peace. I killed my child with my own hands. Uh, I killed Mukha and a killer because how can a father desert his own child and run away? How can he run away and not save his own child? God, if you are watching, please punish me. In what name did Mukha lose her life? Why did she have to perish? And then uh, he shifts to people and read it to me, writes a variation of people and he is called prayer and prayer, a moral prayer for the dead. And what he doesn't mention, which I didn't read to you, is that um, he had two daughters, and he fled with the elder daughter to save her. And he hid the younger daughter, hoping that she would not be discovered. And she was discovered. So first of all, the anguish and grief of this father is certain as great uh, as the anguish and grief of the two mothers who just heard. Two were women, one was a man, but uh, uh, mothers have no uh, privilege, priority in the grief they feel at the loss of a child. Um, but even more interesting here, now of course he didn't kill his child. Germans killed his child. One of the most, for me, painful discoveries from these memoirs and testimonies is the frequency with which the people writing uh, blame themselves for things for which they bear no guilt whatsoever. In the absence of any identifiable murderer here, or in the last one, the baby was taken away, obviously killed in order to save the mother. He gave birth in Auschwitz. Uh, they killed the baby because otherwise the Germans would send both mother and baby to the uh, gas chamber. He blames himself. Uh, I'm tempted to say, fortunately, he didn't survive. I don't really mean that, but uh, his anguish if he had survived, the memory of what he didn't do to save his daughter, or what he thinks he didn't do to save his daughter, would have remained with him as part of the durational <coughs> forever. Uh, one of the problems, as I said, dramatized here is um, the difficulty a lot of survivors have distinguishing between guilt and remorse. And I can't go into that in detail now. If you're interested, we can talk a little bit about it more later. Because he did not give the order that all children under 10 have to be deported. The Germans did. He initiated none of that. He never volunteered to be deported to the large ghetto in the first place. So although paradoxically he loathes guilt after guilt and blame after blame on himself, he is innocent of all of this. He's trapped in a situation which elsewhere I've described as choiceless choice. <coughs> that is, he's not able to choose between the good and the bad or the good and the evil. His only options are between the bad and the worse. Save one daughter because you can't save them both. That's not a good choice. Let both daughters die. Try to save both daughters and all three of you get caught. He has no, what we would call, a decent moral option. And uh, I think after the murders which they committed, the greatest crime of the Germans and their associates and collaborators is driving decent human beings like his father uh, to blame themselves for deeds for which they bear no responsibility. And I have had, I won't say arguments, but discussions with survivors who, when I said that you were guilty of nothing, say, no, no, I feel guilty. It was my fault. And 
you know, I stop the argument from mind that's how the survival of he or she should feel. But I prefer the word remorse rather than guilt because it takes some of the onus away from the criminals who are the really guilty ones. Now, if we move from the world of nonfiction or strict reality, which we've just been dealing with and the testimonies of this fragment, to a short story or fiction by a Polish writer, now living in Israel, but writing from Poland, uh, who uh, survived in hiding in Poland during the war. This is a short story from a collection called A Scrap of Time and Other Stories. The author's name is Ida Fink. She takes a traditional family situation, a mother and father and a three-year-old boy, and she doesn't tell us where they are or what's happening. One of the challenges of this story, as of, of course, testimonies too, is the way in which they solicit us, the readers, the witnesses, to enter imaginatively into the narrative that's being presented to us. If we can't bring ourselves to do that, then those narratives remain inert. I mean, there's no date in this story, there is no time, there's no place. We have to discover in listening to the narrative what's going on, but she doesn't tell us. And if we can't figure out what's going on, we don't know how to respond to it. I want to read this to you because it only takes two or three minutes, only two pages. It's called The Key Game. They had just finished supper and the woman had cleared the table, carried the plates to the kitchen, and placed them in the sink. An innocuous domestic scene, perfectly familiar to all of us. And notice how it grows a little more strange and a little more sinister as it proceeds. The kitchen was mottled with patches of dampness and had a dull yellowish light, even gloomier than in the main room. They had been living here for two weeks. It was their third apartment since the start of the war. They had abandoned the other two in a hurry. The woman came back into the room and sat down again at the table. The three of them sat there, the woman, her husband, and their chubby, blue-eyed, three-year-old child. Lately, they had been talking a lot about the boy's blue eyes and chubby cheeks. No, no one has a name for this story. The woman, the man, and the boy. The boy sat erect, his back straight, his eyes fixed on his father. But it was obvious that he was so sleepy he could barely sit up. The man was smoking a cigarette. His eyes were bloodshot and they kept blinking in a funny way. <clears throat> this blinking had begun soon after they fled the second apartment. It was late, past 10 o'clock. The day had long since ended, and they could have gone to sleep at first. They had to play the game that they had been playing every day for two weeks and still had not got right. Even though the man tried his best and his movements were agile and quick, the fault was his and not the child's. The boy was marvelous. Seeing his father put out a cigarette, he shuddered and opened his blue eyes even wider. The woman who didn't actually take part in the game stroked the boy's hair. We'll play the key game just one more time, only today. Isn't that right? She asked her husband. He didn't answer because he was not sure if this really would be the last rehearsal. They were still two or three minutes off. He stood up and walked towards the bathroom door. Then the woman called out softly, ding dong. She was imitating the doorbell, and she did it beautifully. Her ding dong was quite a soft, lovely bell. At the sound of chimes ringing so musically from his mother's lips, the boy jumped up from his chair and ran to the front door, which was separated from the main room by a narrow strip of corridor. Who's there, he asked. The woman, who alone had remained in her chair, clenched her eyes shut as if she were feeling a sudden, sharp pain. I'll open up in a minute. I'm just looking for the keys, the child called out. Then he ran back to the main room, making a lot of noise with his feet. He ran in circles around the table, pulled out one of the sideboard drawers and slammed it shut. Just a minute, I can't find them. I don't know where Mama put them, he yelled. Then dragged the chair across the room, climbed onto it, and reached up to the top shelf of the étagère. Kind of close us. I found them, he shouted triumphantly. Then he got down from the chair, pushed it back to the table. Without looking at his mother, calmly walked to the door. A cold, musty draft blew in. Stairwell. Shut the door, darling, the woman said softly. You were perfect. You really were. The child didn't hear what she said. He stood in the middle of the room, staring at the closed bathroom door. Shut the door, the woman repeated in a tired, flat voice. Every evening she repeated the same words, and every evening he stared at the closed bathroom door. At last it creaked. The man was pale, and his clothes were streaked with lime and dust. He stood on the threshold and blinked in a funny way. Well, how did it go, asked the woman. 
You still need more time. He has to look for them longer. I slip in sideways all right, but then it's so tight in there that when I turn, and he's got to make more noise, he should stamp his feet louder. The child didn't take his eyes off. Say something to him, the one whispered. He did, he did a good job, little one, a good job, he said mechanically. That's right, the woman said. You're really doing a wonderful job, darling. And you're not little at all. You act just like a grown-up, don't you? And you do know that sometime, that if someone should really ring the doorbell someday when mom is at work, everything will depend on you. Isn't that right? And what will you say when they ask you about your parents? Mom is at work. And Papa? He was silent. And Papa, the man screamed in terror. The child turned pale. And Papa, the man repeated more calmly. He's dead, the child answered, and threw himself at his father, who was standing right beside him, blinking his eyes in that funny way, but it was already long dead to the people who were really dead. Well, well, the domestic situation has gone awry. The child becomes the adult, and the father behaves like a child in hiding. This is a family game, but it's not a family game. It's a dead awareness. The living father is dead already to the child because he's abandoned his role. He's the protector of the child, and the child becomes the protector of the father. This is what I meant at the beginning when I said the hollow parts of the experience is disruption or discontinuity. Traditional notion of how parents and children behave were turned upside down not because children or parents abandoned their role or responsibility, but because circumstances not of their own creating, create, creating has forced them, in order to stay alive and preserve their lives, uh, to <coughs> behave in this way. After the war, they returned to their roles, but as we've seen earlier, the scars of these moments are uh, don't go away. These are not situations of which one is cured. They're not wounds that are healed. What they cause us to do, if we're honest in confronting them, is to revise that notion of the permanence of certain human relationships when they're disrupted by inhuman demands. And this is what I think I think in doing this story in a way that even the uh, people in the testimonies couldn't do because she is a great artist and they are only, they are only people who survive the camps. So you get an invaluable, it seems to me, contribution to our comprehension of understanding of the implications of the Holocaust. Now, just two more things I want to do uh, and then we'll have a chance to talk. Uh, one of the shortest poems in any language is a poem written by Don Pagis, an Israeli who was born in what was then in Romania, uh, um, it's called Written in Pencil for the Sealed Railroad Car. And it's only six lines long. Let me recite it in Hebrew first, and then I'll do it in English. I mean, you notice the title, Written in Pencil for the Sealed Railway Car, is really descriptive. If you listen to the sound of the title in Hebrew, there's an ironic euphony or even melody in the title that you don't find in the translation. Kaku Iparon Bakaron Bakakum written in pencil on the seal, railway car. It goes like this. Kan v'mishloach hazeh mechava v'mhevo v'dei. Im tiru et v'ni ha'gadol ha'in ben adam, tabinu lo shani. In English, here in this transport, I am Eve with Abel, my son. If you see my other son, Cain, son of Adam, tell him that I and one waits in vain for the rest of the poem, and that's where the poem ends. The Holocaust is an unfinished message. And if the reader doesn't know how to take that fragment, tell him that I, and make a narrative out of it, and the reader can enter <coughs> into the implications of this poem, or of the Holocaust itself. A Puggies concentrates into, as I said, six lines, an enormous amount of um, significance. First of all, what is any mother? What message does a mother send? And she's in the box are on her way to her death in the camp to the son who is not there. Tell him that I said he should obey his father. Tell him that I said he should be a good boy. Tell him that I said he should be remember me. Where does the logic continue from that? Well, it's a classic example of discontinuity and disruption. The traditional message 
no longer serves when the journey you're on is not a trip to visit grandma, but a boxcar journey to the death camp, where, where you're going to be killed. So it raises the question of how do we construct a narrative about the Holocaust, given what we know about the Holocaust. He doesn't say we can't construct a narrative about the Holocaust. What he does say is that you can no longer use the ancient story of fratricide as a gloss on the Holocaust, but now we're talk because now we're talking about a genocide. When the fratricide explodes in the genocide, we have not one but two Jewish sagas. A saga uh, beginning with creation and a saga beginning with destruction. The movement from Genesis to Exodus and the journey to the promised land and the journey from deportation and uh, destruction and the gas chamber. They don't negate each other, but they qualify. Uh, what Pavis is suggesting is that if we're going to re-inscribe or rewrite the story of the Jews beginning of the 20th century and looking backwards, we have to add on to the original traditions and the untraditional disruptions that the Holocaust has imposed <coughs> on the Jewish narrative. And what it has imposed depends on us to read it. You see, my other son came to some of them telling them that. Tell him that I am Eve here in this boxcar. We go back to the beginning unless we find a narrative direction which we can take and the poem. And there are narrative directions, but they're not easy to come by. Right? One of the most intriguing ones, and I'm, I'm going to end with this the paintings of Samuel Bach. But uh, let's throw this, turn this off and then Samuel Bach was an artist born in Vilna, which was in 1933, which was Poland, but became Lithuanian. He was nine years old uh, when he was uh, eight years old. In 1941, Germans invaded uh, Lithuania, occupied Vilna, uh, and the Jews were put in a number of ghettos. Bach, who was the only child's mother and father, was put in a ghetto. Uh, I won't tell you the entire story. He was a prodigy artist. He had his first exhibition in 1942 at the age of nine in the He was discovered by the great uh, Yiddish poet Abraham Sutzkeva, uh, who was also in Vilna, and has been painting ever since. Well, it wasn't until about 1995 that he did a series of paintings, 21 paintings, in fact, called Landscapes of Jewish Experience. Each painting, as you can imagine it, was five feet by six feet. I'm just going to show you two of them, because we don't have that much time. Uh, but there were 21 of them. And they appeared in a book called Landscape of Jewish Experience, which I wrote the text and a commentary on these paintings. And they're quite extraordinary. Bach picks up or takes up where Don Pablo's poem left off, because he asked himself the question of whether to paint the consequences and implications of the Holocaust the Jewish experience while we were in pain. And just one example of uh, one of his favorite uh, subjects, the, two t the, the Tables of the Law, the Ten Commandments. Uh, one of the paintings is called uh, De Profundis, from Out of the Depths. And one of the songs, I think the 130th psalm again from Out of the Depths, we call to the Lord. But in the painting, you see two enormous graves and lying in each of the, and they, they are tablet shaped, lying in each grave in, uh, is one of the tables of the Lord uh, shattered into fragments, being buried. Because the Ten Commandments are uh, not destroyed by the Holocaust, but uh, they were the beginning of the covenant uh, in which an arrangement was made between God and his chosen people. You accept me as your one God, and I will protect you as my people. Obviously, in the Holocaust, that agreement was violated. The number six looms large in a lot of these paintings. Represent the number six commandment, Lotiazak, do not murder, but the number six commandment. 
too. The arithmetic of the Holocaust had not only affected but afflicted the arithmetic of the Ten Commandments, not negating the Ten Commandments, but causing us to somehow reconstruct them. In another of the paintings, he has a, a Mount Sinai with fragments of the original Ten Commandments strewn over its slopes, and on the top, top two new tablets, totally blank, except that one of them are the letters Adonai, the name of the Lord, nothing else, as if to ask who will reinscribe the post Holocaust commandments and what will they say. But of the 21 paintings, only three have human figures in them the first, the middle one, and the last. And I'm going to show you the first and the last. Uh, the first one is called um, Self Portrait. Now, if you think for a minute about Self Portrait, Van Gogh painted many self portraits. Rembrandt painted many self-portraits. So, uh, the favorite subject for artists. Uh, a self-portrait is a portrait of the self. Rembrandt in his portraits has versions of his own face. And so for Van Gogh. Uh, notice what's in Bach's self-portrait. Uh, oh, there it is. Sometimes <laughs> maybe you see it on. Uh, let me turn the light down a little bit so you can see it. Uh, but we have uh, kind of blow ups, blow ups, I'll show you in a minute, for various parts of the painting. So you'll be able to see the parts better. That's part of the block. In fact, that's his face as a young boy. But the center of the painting is dominated not by a portrait of the artist as a young boy, who holds in his hand, you'll see in the middle, a paintbrush. Up here are enormous blank canvases. Uh, the teller that I am painting, what will the boy Bach, who survived the Vilna Ghetto, uh, put in those canvases when he grows up? The center of the painting is dominated by a kind of silhouette or effigy. You'll see a close up in a minute. Uh, the most famous photograph come out of the Holocaust, the boy in Warsaw Ghetto with his hands raised, the soldiers pointing rifles at him, and they partake of each other. One of the things that's been disrupted by the Holocaust, Bach suggests, is the very notion of an integrated and independent self. Whatever this boy becomes, this living boy, can't be separated from the murder of that dead boy. Uh, you'll see uh, in a minute that his hands uh, had stigmata in them, and if those arms were just turned 90 degrees, it becomes cruciform. Um, one of the questions raised in this painting by Bach is the role of Christian thought and Christian behavior in the faith of the Jews. You see in the distance the civilization in flames, uh, smokestacks of a ship about to set out on a voyage, but Throughout this series, smokestacks have a kind of sinister um, analogy to the crematorium chimney with the smoke rising up, and you see the fire there. Um, you see little stones and pebbles here. There's a Jewish tradition, as some of you know, when you visit a cemetery, uh, you pick up little pebbles and put them on top of the gravestones in the form of commemoration. Uh, there's an unrolled scroll here, and the pages of the Torah scroll are blank. Uh, who will be, who will reinscribe the Torah telling the new story of the Jews and what will it say? The boy is in a sack. Uh, this is a kind of rebirth, but at the same time it's a redeath because uh, the boy hovering over him is like the ghost of Hamlet's father saying, remember me. He will not be able to escape the image of the murdered boy. Um, Bach's family were discovered in hiding by the Germans. The mother got away, but the father and Bach, who at that time would have been 11 years old, were taken to a labor camp on the outskirts of Wilma, um, where the father had to chop up logs and little pieces of wood and put them in big sacks with the Germans running out of fuel and using wood to fuel some of their trucks. One day, the father took a big empty sack and put Bach inside it. He was, uh, He's, he's a short man, and he was skinny at the time, and very light. And he carried him out into the main warehouse, where everyone was laying these big sacks down on a pile to be put on trucks to take them away. When no one was looking, he walked over to the window of the ground floor of the warehouse and dropped the sack containing the box outside the window. And I said, this is on the outskirts of the town. 
Uh, the mother was in hiding with an older relative who had been raised as a Christian, married a Christian, and the German didn't know she was Jewish, and she sent her maid to walk outside the fence by the camp, knowing that he was going to be dropped out. When he was dropped out, he climbed out of the sack, stood up, she took him by the hand and walked over with him and brought him back to the house where they were hiding. Um, a few weeks later, the Russians uh, liberated Vilna. Uh, two days before they liberated Vilna, the Germans shot his father and killed him. Killed him. And his four grandparents were also shot at a place called Ponary, a forest grove outside of Vilna. So he has a heritage of death behind him. Now, let's See, one of the things Bach likes to do, and you deduce this from what I described about the Ten Commandments, which he likes to keep painting, is to repaint a similar idea. So there you have cutouts of the boy with his hands raised. Here you see bullet holes, that means the mother. And he's done a series of about ten paintings of that boy in different guises, because he believed that no single portrait of any event can capture that event. We have to look at versions of it to try to understand it. Here yeah, you can see more clearly the boy. Primo Levi wrote in one of his books, Death Begins with the Shoes. If you lost your shoes and your feet were not covered, they were infected, you couldn't work, and you were killed. The boy already is retreating into the elements around him, into the fragments of wood, uh, so that his whole self is no longer beginning to disintegrate. Your shoes are empty. Bach will have to invent someone to replace that boy and not kill there's the photograph that just went to a lot of me on a few bases. There's a boy, you know. I call this a kind of post-Holocaust Mona Lisa, except there's no mysterious smile on his face. Instead, there's a kind of sad, reflective, internalized stare. And, you know, we have to ask what's going on inside that head. There's a paintbrush. Some expression. You certainly couldn't pull it to anyone. Here are those memorial stones. Constant reminder. Now, the next painting, this is the last in the series, is called The Sounds of Silence. The Sounds of Silence. One of the preeminent issues raised by the Holocaust is whether, in fact, art can be created out of it or after it. And if so, what would the content of your art be? It can't be a celebration of the beauty of the Holocaust because there's no beauty in the Holocaust. It can't be a celebration of uh, the formal dignity of the Holocaust because it wasn't a dignified event. So we have a string quartet. We have a mass violinist. We have a viola, so you'll see more clearly later on. Uh, his uh, profile is etched into the stone. You have a blindfolded cellist painting an eerie blue cello. And you have a violist whose head is already turned into stone, encased in a large block of wood with a number one on it. It's like a, a guy from a pair of dice, suggesting maybe that their fate is merely a whim of chance. Uh, at this point, we don't have to see an entire crematorium chimney. It's cut off at the top, but we can imagine what's there. This X uh, for the Ten Commandments, for the mystery of iniquity. If you just rotate it a little bit, it becomes a crucifix crematorium chimney there. In other words, they are playing their music uh, within the frame of destruction. Because post-Holocaust art cannot thrive apart from the destruction that gave it birth. Two of the musicians are wearing a weighted down by wings, suggesting the burden and rather the liberation of what they once represented uh, spiritually. Um, you see the facade of the ghetto in ruins here. It's a common theme of the Vilna ghetto, with Bach is lamenting. And here again, a, a, a tattered uh, Torah scroll, which tells the story, or has to tell the story anew, but uh, not the same old story, or the same old story with addenda incorporating what they have experienced. Now it's called the sounds of silence. 
And one of the issues that recurs in uh, Holocaust art is um, the question of what kind of harmony can emerge from it and how to include in that harmony the unspoken. Pagas at the end of this poem where he says, if you see my other son came from the son of Adam, tell him that I. Silence is built into that poem. The unspoken remnant of the message. Here too, silence is built in. What kind of sound could they be bringing forth from their instruments? We have to participate in the painting if we're going to answer that question. And you see close-ups of some of these. See, already the violinist has lost part of his fleshly self. He's become wood. Is it Bach is trying to suggest that although he has survived uh, the event, uh, he hasn't survived the event intact. Um, his uh, vocation, his profession as artist, as a musician, has also survived. Uh, he knows how to play his instrument, but uh, his music after the Holocaust will not be the same as his music. Too. There you get a clearer view of the second violinist who already disappeared. And here again, you get a clearer sense of the uh, he's he's a petrified man. And it's an interesting play because petrified means terrified, but petrified also means turned to stone, to fear. And so both, both words operate there. But the terror of his memory has altered the substance of his self, which still exists, but exists different from what it was. ruins of a community, the ruins of a civilization, as if their art is built on uh, ruins like this. What I call in the title of one of my books, The Ruins of Memory. And you can build something on the ruins of memory, but it certainly isn't a celebration. Uh, you have to invent the word. Uh, it's a death life. That Chris describes it. I think this is the last. All right, I thank you very much.